God has a master plan, and uh, we're so confident that everything is going to work out according to that plan, because he is the almighty God. Thank you, choir, for that lovely song. I want you to start, please, singing the last uh, hymn, practically the last hymn, in the chorus book, How Great Thou Art. We have to stand for this, of course. How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
sounded so good from up here. Thank you so much for singing. And I believe you mean it with all your heart. Isn't it true, though? He's so great. Praise the Lord for that. Bow in a word of prayer. Okay? Father, we're so grateful indeed for all of your children that have come and have de decided to fellowship with us. We want to thank you indeed, O oh God, uh, for journeying mercies. We prayed for their safety, and here they are this evening. We want to thank you for this. And we're asking, Lord, that the word of God will have a, a true effect on our lives, that our love will deepen for you and our service will uh, be one of encouragement. Bless the servants of God that will be ministering. Be with dear brother Randy tonight as he opens a book uh, for us, that our hearts will go away blessed indeed, knowing the will of God. Thank you for your word, Lord, and we just pray special blessings to be with us. Remember those who couldn't be with us because of illness. We commend them to your grace and your love this evening. Thank you again for all that we have in Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now we have the group selection, and then the trio and the choir. <laughs>
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. of Jesus. There is no moment, there is no distance, there is no heartbreak He can take you through. So before you think that you're too lost to say, Single dream 
I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I try to win this war What's on my heart tonight will begin in Psalm 97, please. The book of the Psalms in uh, number 97. And it will have to do with the subject of love. We all know from the Bible in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. What is this love? What's it like? Well, anyway, we see one verse here 
in Psalm 97 and verse 10. Psalm 97 and verse 10. 97, 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. God does bless us reading of the word, and we plan to read more later, Lord willing. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. And all of a sudden we discover there's a love that hates because there's evil. You might understand that if you... Uh, have a child and they start to tamper with drugs, you're going to hate that. And the very reason you hate it is because you love them. You don't want to see them harmed. They're in a boat and they're about ready to jump, a little toddler about ready to jump in with the sharks. You're going to hate that situation because you love the child. True love, God's love, hates evil. It has to because it loves. Now I understand that's the Old Testament. Same thing in the New. Go, go to Romans chapter 12, please. Book of Romans and uh, chapter 12. Romans 12, and uh, we'll get down to verse 9. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. It says, uh, let love be without dissimulation. ESV will have let love be genuine. But notice the rest of verse 9. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So in the context of love here, you're to abhor. It's actually a little stronger than hate. Stand in horror of, I mean, be terribly afraid of that which is evil. So ye that love the Lord hate evil. You know, uh, there was a message at a royal wedding a year, maybe a year and a half ago, where the so-called bishop was there, and he gave an illustration, and he was trying to prove the power of love, and he said, the power of fire, when mankind learned to harness the power of fire, it transformed society. He used examples like we, we learned how to cook food with a flame and got warm food. Up north, not here, we learned how to heat our houses with that, okay? Uh, your boats down here have a spark plug, most of them, and that's spark ignites, that's why you can move. Uh, rockets into outer space, the internet, GPS, all kind of things, uh, uh, from, from the harnessing fire. He went on to say that we need to unleash the power of love. And there is a power in love. It can heal a broken heart. It can soothe you. It can bring some fulfillment to your life. And so the message was, like we unleashed fire, let's learn to unleash love. The whole context wasn't good. I'm not going to go into that, though. But you see, as powerful even fire is, it has to have boundaries. It has to be controlled. In Oregon and California, my area, forest fires damaging homes and everything. Hawaii, the volcanic eruption and hot lava and fire uh, destroying people. It can burn homes. It can burn bodies. Fire needs boundaries. I want to tell you, love needs boundaries. Ye that love the Lord hate evil, you know. Uh, uh, love out of control. Why, there can be a jilted relationship and a broken heart. There can be divorce love without boundaries. And it'll not only hurt hearts, it can divide a family. It can divide an assembly. It can even divide a nation sometimes. Uh, love without boundaries. But, but as we study God's love, it hates evil. It has boundaries. You see, brothers and sisters, th there's other characteristics to God besides love. True, God is love. God is also just. He's called the just God, Acts 7.52. God is also holy. It is written, be ye holy as I am holy, 1 Peter 1.16. Uh, all his ways are judgment, Deuteronomy 32.4. The Lord Jesus said, you know it, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, etc. He's truth. And God will never sacrifice one attribute on the altar of love. They all bounce together. Sometimes I understand we sing of the boundless love of God. And the way we mean it, that's correct. If you mean by the boundless love of God that, that there's nobody that is excluded from salvation, every continent, every country, uh, you're absolutely right. It's boundless. John sees people from every kindred and tongue and people and nation redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. If you mean how many sins his blood, his sacrifice for, can forgive, it's boundless. 
The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise the Lord for that. If you mean how far God came down to the point of sacrificing his own son, that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, it's boundless. If that's what you mean by boundless, you're, you're good. But if you mean by boundless that there's no boundaries, that it's not bound by truth or holiness or justice, then we don't understand the bigness of our God. You know, uh, Hosea 12, 6 puts it this way. It says, keep mercy and judgment. The ESV will translate that, hold fast to love and justice. Love but justice and just righteousness and fairness. Because God is right, the Bible teaches. And, and so when it comes to God's love, it just doesn't love everything. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. So what I'd like to do tonight, first I'd like to take you to an Old Testament example and show you an example of love without boundaries, of justice and holiness and truth. And it can be devastating as a fire, if not more. Then I want to take you to the New Testament and show you it teaches love with boundaries. So, so looking at a negative example first tonight of, of, of just we hear today, just love, just show love. But it needs the boundaries. It can't cross over that line of evil. It has to abhor evil. You, you know, as a 1 Corinthians 13, 6 teaches about charity or love. It, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. This is God's love. I love with boundaries in that sense. So let's look at a negative example of love running without boundaries. And go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 13, please. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Just look at a few highlights here through 14. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Context is King David, and he in those days had more than one wife. And uh, therefore, he had sons and daughters, but they weren't always f full brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters. They had different mothers. And because he's a king, they would live in different houses. So it wouldn't be like one family in one house. That'll kind of explain what's happening here, okay? Uh, it's going to involve David's children, a, a brother and a half-sister. And, and you look here in 2 Samuel 13, and we'll come to verse 1. 2 Samuel 13 and verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. This chapter starts out with love. Uh, uh, Absalom had a fair sister, and, and, and his half-brother Amnon loved Tamar, it says. Well, verse 2. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. I mean, he was just struck. We, we call it lovesick. He didn't know how to talk to her, didn't know how to act, just froze up in her presence. Uh, he fell sick for his sister Tamar. Well, verse 3. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, a son of Shemaiah, David's brother. And uh, Jonadab was a very subtle man. So he's going to show him how he can get over this and actually meet Tamar in a closer way. Verse 4. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? He said, you're starving away. You're skin and bones. You're not eating. You're royalty. Why are you so thin? And look at the answer at the end of verse 4. Look at the answer at the end of verse 4. And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. It's a love story. I love. He said, that's wonderful. It's going to be love without God's boundaries of holiness and justice and righteousness. It's going to be disastrous. But anyway, let's see how the story goes. Jonadab goes on to tell him, look, you pretend like you're sick. And you say that it's only Tamar's cooking. That, you know, like we say, good chicken soup can revive me. You just, it's her cooking, and I need her to come and fix a meal for me. I'm very sick. So he feigned sickness, and uh, David heard it. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, it says, uh, Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. And, and then he said, uh, that's nice, but, you know, do you ever get so sick you don't even want people to be around? Well, that's what he feigned. He said, I can't even eat it here. Too many. Get him out of the house. And the house was empty. He said, now bring it into my inner chamber. And she brought, and they were alone, and, and then it happened, his true motives here. Uh, look at verse 11, verse 11. And when she had brought him unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. 
And she answered him, Nay or no? The answer is no, my brother. Do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? As for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools of Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Just to lay hold of me and seize me. Uh, I don't understand the whole culture here, but among half-brothers and half-sisters, there, there, there was a legal way to go about this, formal, legal, but uh, he wanted nothing to do with that. Well, v verse 14. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than her, and she forced her and lay with her. All because I love Tamar. Now verse 15. Verse 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her, and Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. His love turned to hate. He had what he had, and it was no true love of the person. It was, we call it lust today and passion. And he said, Get out of here. <laughs> wow. Look at verse 16. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Now that you have had me, don't do a further evil and send me away. You see, according to the word of God, according to the law that Israel was under, the righteous, holy law of God, Deuteronomy 22, you know, verses 28 and 29 would teach that if a man seized a virgin, you know what he had to do? He had to marry her. He had to marry her. He had to pay her father a value price. In those days, it was 50 shekels of silver. And he was never allowed to divorce her for any reason. He had humiliated her. Had to protect and provide for her with life with no escape clauses. That's, that's what needed to be done. And she's pleading for that. But, but, but no justice here. No, no truth applied here. So he just says, get out of here. He would not hearken. So look at verse 17. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. <laughs> And lock her out. And she had a garment of divers colors upon her, for with such robes were the king daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then the servant brought her out and bolted the door after her like an animal. Locked her out, sent her away as a virgin, robbed of everything. N no provision or protection as a wife now. Verse 19, all starting with love without God's boundaries. Verse 19, and Tamar put ashes on her head, and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her and laid uh, her hand on her head and went on crying, brokenhearted and disgraced and rejected like an animal. Well, Absalom, her brother, he heard about it, verse 20. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But now hold thy peace, my sister, he is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Pretend like you didn't care. Well, you know, it's a family thing. Things happen in family. Let's just keep it in the family. At least that's the way he acted. And then enter King David, the king, in verse 21. But when Dave, King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And what happens now as the king enters the scene is a battle not with the Philistines, not with the giant now, but a bigger battle, a battle of love and justice. According to God's word, according to God's word, he would have to marry her. There would have to be a penalty. Uh, uh, what will he do now? He's angry. But there's no justice for Tamar here. And Absalom sees that. Look at verse 22. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good or bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Now there's a hatred. Amnon, he got away with it. Well, look at verse 28. Look at 2 Samuel 13, verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Absalom's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have I not commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. I'm always amazed at top men, they'll tell you to have courage to do what they're not going to do. Uh, they, kill him for me. And they killed, and Amnon died. And uh, uh, because Absalom had him murdered. So Absalom, of course, flees because of that. Uh, verse 34. Look, look at verse 34. But Absalom fled. You know, according to the word of God, once Absalom should be accosted, he is to be put to death. If any man kill another man, he shall surely die, says Leviticus 24, 17. Absalom, though he's a king's son, now is guilty of murder, and justice would say he would have to die. Well, he flees. And look at verse 37. Verse 37 of 2 Samuel 13. 
But Absalom fled and went to Telemai, the son of Ahimahad, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. One son is dead, and his other son's away. It's family, and he loves his son Absalom, and his heart starts to go out to him. Verse 38, and Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. I mean, three years of separation. And now verse 39, and the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. Amnon's dead. I'd like to see Absalom back. He loves his son. He has no, idea, he has no intention to put him to death. Now, Joab senses that. But still, there's some hard feelings. So Joab gets a wise woman here of Tekoa and, and says, uh, as we would say today, go in with some fake news. You know? And she went in with a fake case to David that she was a widow and uh, she had two sons and they were fighting in the field and one killed the other. And now the elders of the city wants to put the son that killed him to death, which would have been right. But she says, I'll, I'll have no seed left and my husband's name won't go on. And, and, and you just look at that here in verse 7 of chapter 14. Look at chapter 14 and verse 7. And behold, the whole family has risen against thy handmaid, and they said, Deliver him that smote his brother, and we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he slew, and we will destroy her hair also. And, and so shall they quench my coal which is left, and shall not leave my husband to my husband, neither my uh, name nor remainder upon the earth. To make a long story short, uh, David bought the ruse that sin must be punished, but sometimes there's maybe a good reason not to. Should be, but sometimes because of the dire circumstances, maybe you just shouldn't and end up saying your son can live, though it was a fake case. Uh, and then the woman says, well, you got to live what you preach, so to speak. Verse 13, look at verse 13. And the woman said, Wherefore then hast thou thought such a thing against the people of God? For the king doth speak this thing as one which is faulty, in that the king doth not fetch home his banished. His banished. She's talking about Amnon who's dead or Absalom who killed him. Well, she's talking about Absalom. Doesn't fetch home his banished. Verse 14 she says to him, For we must needs die, and our water spilled upon the ground which cannot be gathered again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. Where's water spilled upon the ground? In America, we put it this way. There's no use crying over spilled milk. Water falls on the ground. So you spill milk. You can't gather it up again. So the logic is, since you can't solve the past problem, just make the best of things, forget about the past, and go on. As they say today, how do you unscramble an egg? You can't do it. And so the logic is, don't deal with the past, just make the present better. It's water up on a spilled ground. So, so, so David uh, sees that he has to now live what he preached here, and he gives permission to, to bring him back again. Look at verse 21. And there'll be no penalty of death. It's love triumphing over justice. Love without boundaries. In verse 21, And the king said unto Joab, Behold, now I have done this thing. Go therefore and bring the young man Absalom again. He was brought back to Jerusalem. But the feelings were still hard. And they didn't speak to each other. David wouldn't see his face for two more years, making five years. And Absalom says, Well, he brought me back and he doesn't see me. Why bring me back? He tried to get an audience with General Joab, and he couldn't get it. So jo jo uh, Absalom says, Joab, field on fire. So he knocks on his door. He said, why'd you burn my field? He said, I, I want to see my father. <laughs> I, need, I need to get an audience with you. Well, well, look here at verse 33. Verse 33, chapter 14. So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. You say, what lovely story. The man got over his hard feelings, and there he is kissing his son, who had a half right to be angry and things like that. He kissed his son without repentance. He never carried out the judgment and justice of a holy God. He sacrificed justice on the altar of love, something God doesn't do. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. I'm not going to go into it in chapter 15, but you know what happened. Absalom, with a bitter, hard heart, steals the throne from his father David. And then David flees into the wilderness for his life, and Absalom sends troops to pursue him to kill his father. And he has relations with some of his concubines and disgraces King David. In God's providence, Absalom eventually died. 
And so a kiss without repentance, a kiss without justice. And so it wrecked the family. It brought a nation down. A new king came. David was off the throne for a while. All kind of problems happened in Israel. Love without boundaries. It's devastation of a volcano. It's fire without boundaries. Now, now seeing that example of how sometimes we can scrap justice and judgment and truth and the holiness of God's word for love. But God's love hates evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. I want to now take you into the New Testament and show you that God's love is indeed a love that has boundaries because it, it's true love. It's pure love, as 1 Peter 1.22 would talk about pure love. It, it, it doesn't transgress other characteristics. So go with me to a place you probably know, Philippians chapter 1, please. Uh, the book of Philippians and chapter 1. Paul praying for the Christians here and exhorting them. And Philippians chapter 1. We'll just go down here to verse 9, okay? Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, In this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in all in knowledge and in all judgment. Your love may abound. I want to see it grow, not only toward God and toward one another, the Bible teaches. I want to see it multiply, abound. But notice he puts what we call it up north twin river banks. Uh, it's boundaries in knowledge and in all judgment, or some of you will have discernment. Verse 10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense until uh, the day of Christ. Uh, love has the boundary of knowledge. What is God's will that we were talking about the other night? What pleases the Lord? Judgment or, or uh, discernment. What is right and what is wrong in God's eyes? What is best and will glorify God? In judgment. You know, we're, we we're told today, don't judge. That's only half the verse. Yeah. Lord Jesus said, judge not, John 7, 24, according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We got, it has to be righteous judgment. And so, you know, you have the, uh, what's it called, the glass window bridge, right? I got that right over in the Lutheran. I've gone across it. Lovely there, Atlantic Ocean on both sides, the, the bank, the low part, the high part. Uh, lovely there, unless there's a rage and a hurricane. And, and what happens when there's too much water? It overflows the boundaries. And you, you've seen serious accidents here, right? I understand that. And, and lost cars and that. And suddenly something that's great, when, when those boundaries aren't up anymore, it, it's devastating. And so God's love, yes, it's to abound, but through those two boundaries of knowledge, what God wants, uh, of discernment, of what's the best, what's right and wrong. You go over those boundaries, it'll be disastrous. And that's why Paul prays that way. Let me show you another example uh, of love with boundaries. Go, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, please. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 2. I'm going to start you for now in verse 7. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. He's talking about something he wrote them about in 1 Corinthians, it appears to be. And that is a man who was committing sexual sin, sexual immorality, a kind of level that even the world didn't do. He had his father's wife, you know. It's in the church of God. And uh, concerning this man... That was in deep sexual sin, and there's a whole list of sins we shouldn't be involved in, including drunkenness, railing, things like that. But uh, look here at verse 7. Look at 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Well, forgive him, comfort him. Look at verse 8. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Well, here it is, you say. Yes, people fail, but you love him. You comfort, love covers everything. I'd be a false teacher if I just read you that section and skipped verse 6. So look at verse 6. Verse 6. 2 Corinthians 2, 6. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Before he was forgiven, before he was to be comforted in love, before he was to be confirmed in that sense, 
and comforted. There was a punishment. There, there was justice. There was truth. It's all in 1 Corinthians 5 when the public assembly was gathered together. It wasn't done in a separate room. He was delivered to Satan. He was excommunicated. They judged those that are within. You know, it's the judgment of God. Uh, and 1 Corinthians 5.13 says, Wherefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. He's out of the church fellowship and a breaking of bread. In fact, eating together in a social way he shunned. Uh, with such a one, no, not to eat, 1 Corinthians 5.11. And so there is a punishment. Justice is carried out. So others don't say, well, I can just live any way I want. They, they see that it, God cares how you live. And so it doesn't spread like leaven or yeast. There's at times to be excommunication. Once the punishment happens, then he says again, verse 7, so that contrary wise, ye are rather forgive him and comfort him, confirm your love toward him in verse 8. So often today, we'll go with love without boundaries like David and Absalom did, and we'll love, like in the case of David, we'll kiss before there's repentance. Oh, there's a way back when there's repentance. We'll kiss before the punishment happens, and, and it brings disaster when it doesn't uphold God's holiness or justice. It's a love without boundaries. Yes, there's a love that will take anybody back, but it's based on sufficient to the man is the punishment thereof. If you think that's strange, we can't think it's too strange. That's our gospel, isn't it? The gospel that saved you and I, isn't that our gospel? You say, well, yes, we're forgiven. Oh, we are if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't happen without punishment. Just in closing, just to get a little sketch here of the gospel, go to Romans chapter 1, please. Let's go back to the book of Romans and this time uh, chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This is all about the gospel of God, the power of God unto salvation, and uh, it doesn't start with the love of God. It's an exposition of the gospel. It's a wonderful book. It lays out the gospel. Oh, it will get to the love of God in chapter 5. It doesn't start with it. Sometimes we'll start our gospel to the sinner that God loves you. I understand what you mean, but some will react, of course, he loves me. I'm a lovable person. Why shouldn't he love me? That's not why he loves you. Uh, he starts with the wrath of God. Look at verse 18. The judgment of God. Uh, Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The righteous anger, the wrath of God is revealed. God's holy. He's a God of judgment. All his ways are judgment and just. And it's against man, not against vegetables or whales or dolphins against men it says uh, for ungodliness and unrighteousness we don't glorify God we don't put God first we do what is wrong it's called unrighteousness but not only that verse 18 really says more than that look at the end of verse 18 who hold the truth in unrighteousness Men and women, whether they have the law, the Bible, or don't have it, they know there's a God through creation, and they know what right and wrong is through a conscience, and they also, those that have the Bible, know it from that. And the, the, God is saying that they haven't, they're not innocent because they're not ignorant. You know, it's hard to be upset with somebody who's ignorant. When, when I go home, uh, Lord willing, July 1st after Nassau, my little grandson, he hasn't turned three yet, Michael Levin. He's, not a, he's like me. He's not as stable on his feet as his sister is. He's going to come to greet me, and he's going to be slobbering a little bit, and he's going to step all over my feet. And I'm not going to be upset in the least. <laughs> little fellow's glad to see me. He doesn't really know what he's doing yet. Now, our brother would never do that. I'll just pick on you, Gerald. If I came in and Gerald looked at me and stamped on my foot and spit at me, I got different emotions. There's different, because he knew exactly what he was doing. That's what God is saying. They've held the truth in unrighteousness. They've sinned while knowing better that there's a God and there's right and wrong. Therefore, look at verse 32. Just looking at a quick sketch here. Look, look at Romans 1 and verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, don't only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. Worthy of death, eternal separation from God and conscious torment. Wages of sin is death. Soul to sin that shall die, Ezekiel 18, 4. God's penalty of sin. Look at chapter 2 and verse 5. Romans 2 and verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, 
treasureth up unto thyself wrath against a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Gospel starts with the judgment of God, our sin that deserves it. It gives us a reason to be saved. And then, just chapter 3. It shows a punishment for that sin. Before God will justify you or me or declare us righteous and make us a child of God and cleanse us from every sin and give us the Holy Spirit, there had to be a punishment. <laughs> had to be justice. You, you look here at chapter 3 and it tells you all about it. Look, look at verse uh, 24. Romans 3 and verse 24. It says, Being justified, declared righteous, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The redemption. We have redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1, 7. This is the cross. This is his sacrifice. This is God laying the punishment of our sin upon him, wounded for our transgressions, you know, Isaiah 53, 5. You're not saved without a punishment first, but it didn't happen to you. It happened to his son, the Lord Jesus, who was sinless. And through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. You know, brothers and sisters and friends, redemption in a very simple meaning. One of the meanings is to make a right wrong. Say one of your husbands forgets your wife's anniversary. It's late in the day and you forgot it. And somebody reminds you, hey, you know, it's your anniversary. Oh, fine. And what you do, you go out and get two dozen flowers, get the, high, the reservation, the fanciest restaurant, ten boxes of chocolate, and your buddy will say to you, you just redeemed yourself. And what he meant is you just, made a right, you just made a wrong right. The Lord Jesus made a wrong right at the cross. He died for our sins. That's the wages of sin. And so there was justice. So look what it goes on to say in verse 25. Romans 3 and verse 25, speaking of Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now watch verse 26. Now that Christ has died and shed his blood, and our faith brings us into that. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The gospel God never sacrificed his justice on the altar of love. He sacrificed the son of his love on the justice of the cross. He died for our, the God is just. The way he saves you, that's why Christ had to die. So your gospel that saves us is a gospel with punishment first. And so in living the Christian life, don't think it's foreign like in the church. There's a punishment when there's certain sins. Before there can be forgiveness, it has to be dealt with. Something David bypassed with Amnon and then with Absalom. And love overpowered the man. And he kissed without repentance. He confirmed without love without punishment. And he lost his throne for a while. So may God encourage us tonight in God's type of love. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. Don't buy into the worldly lie that, that love loves everything. It's without boundaries. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Abhor evil. It'll be, if you take those boundaries away, it'll wreck your life, the assembly. Uh, but, but God's type of love, why there'll be holiness and justice, it all blends together, and it's the very reason you're saved tonight. So tonight I just want to encourage you a little bit in God's love. What his love is, God is love, and ye that love the Lord hate evil. Just may God bless his word to the assembly and the saints tonight. And we're going to pray and ask him to do that. Our heavenly, holy, gracious Father, we're in thy presence, and we're only in there because thou hast loved the world and gave thy son. But it never bypassed anything else. Justice and holy, all satisfied in the Lord Jesus. And so, Father, tonight just bless thy word in a way that we can't. We are dependent upon thee through the Holy Spirit. Some need encouragement. Some might have bought into the fake love rather than the genuine love. And bought into the world's definition and think that love justifies everything, and it doesn't. To see what thy love is and to see how the Lord Jesus fulfilled it and to walk in his steps. So, Father, just again, a blessing to the dear saints here tonight. And if any are without Christ, they'll see that there was justice for their sin in the Lord Jesus. If they put their faith in him and the blood that he shed, they'll leave here justified, righteous, 
before thee, a holy God, because the price has been paid. Praise and thank thee for the conference, the goodness, the openness of the word, and ask thy blessing on the weekend. In the name and for the glory, Father, of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.